Hello and welcome to this Red Gamer Tech video, myself and Marta, where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Today we are going to kick things off with a little something from NVIDIA, as we have basically an announcement that they're getting even more involved with the Open Risk v Instruction Set architecture following a partnership with AdaCore, which is going to see it migrate, quote, some system on a chip product lines away from proprietary ISAs. Now the fact that NVIDIA have been working on or working with, should I say, the risk of the instructions that architecture is not exactly a secret because, well, they have basically been involved from almost a year dot. They are a platinum level founding member of the Risk V Foundation and they have publicly commented on its work to shift to Risk V for logic processing on their graphics processors. But what we have here is a sort of further step into that as they have announced a partnership with a fellow Risk V Foundation member, AdaCore which is basically focusing on the use of the ADA programming language alongside a high integrity variant Spark to basically rewrite firmware which is used in autonomous vehicles and other safety and security platforms. So let's put that in some clearer words, shall we? We've got a statement from Quentin O'Shem, the lead business development at AdaCore, and he says, quote, NVIDIA's selection of Ada and Spark ushers in a new era in the history of safety and security critical software development. We are proud to be contributing to the industrial standards set by such a market leader. And further on he goes to say, some NVIDIA system on a chip product lines will more great to a new architecture using the RISC V instruction set architecture. But unfortunately, there is hide nor here of which products are going to be affected. At the moment, at least, NVIDIA's SOC designs are focused exclusively on proprietary ARM processor core families, and they use the ARM ISA. So essentially, we could see them ditching ARM altogether in favour of RISC-V, given that they are partnering with AdaCore. We could see this primarily focused on their autonomous vehicle products, but could potentially expand elsewhere out through its portfolio. Now, they've, we've seen them do similar before. Obviously, the first we well with Volta, for example, that was obviously purely for data center AI, all that sort of thing. And some of what they learned with Volta on. Um, undoubtedly made its way into Turing, although of course we've got a lot in Turing that we never saw in Volta and, and obviously the other way around as well. So we do tend to see this where they'll have like a sort of server end or AI end product and it will kind of get stripped down and what they've learned there will get to kind of get brought down to a consumer level and this is not just a video that do this of course, many many companies do in this particular field. So unfortunately again we do not know exactly what SOC designs are being targeted for a shift but it would make sense given what AdaCore do for it to be sort of the AI autonomous end of their products, which of course NVIDIA love to talk about their autonomous and their driver um, and their AI and all that sort of stuff. But again, we could see purely risk V focus eventually trickle down to the consumer level, or it could just stay at the sort of higher end. It's hard to say. But we're going to move on to Intel now. And the next words out of my mouth are probably going to surprise you because it's actually regarding a 7nm production node. And yes, I just said the words 7nm when 10nm isn't even out on the market yet. They've not exactly had a good time with that particular die shrink, to say the least. Obviously, they've had a bunch of 14nm NM shortages, and then obviously the meme level delays to 10nm haven't really helped. And obviously, everyone was sort of tearing ahead of them with AMD already on 7nm and so on and so forth. But despite all of these issues, according to an online publication, The Oregonian, they are going to be basically opening a factory in Hillsborough, Oregon with 7NM production facilities, and this was later confirmed by Intel. And they said that they are currently considering the construction of, quote, a massive new semiconductor fa factory in Hillsborough, which will surely run in the billions of dollars and rank among the largest capital products projects in Oregon history. But obviously they are just now upgrading this production facility to basically be ready for 7nm production. So obviously we're not going to be expecting it anytime soon. The first 7nm node will most likely not be ready before mid-2020. We're expecting the first 7nm CPUs from Intel to launch in late 2020 at the soonest, that is at the soonest, so it could even be later than that, which gives AMD a nice comfortable head start of over a year, which I'm sure they are just loving. Now, of course, it comes to down to more than NM. Obviously, there are multiple factors at play, as I've discussed, and also as Paul has discussed multiple times, but it still is not a good thing that your competition has such a lead on you, 
And obviously AMD are not the only ones that have this lead, but they are the most direct competitor in this regard. So, next up, we're going to talk about Intel, Ice Lake, and security. Now, last year, we talked a lot, and I do mean a lot, about Spectre and Meltdown. It just felt like every other week there was more news about it, and then after that finally died down, there was more security vulnerabilities that kept popping up all over the place and obviously did not help Intel's issues. And now we have a very interesting report from Digital Trends which is discussing how IceLake is going to still be vulnerable to Spectre Variant 1 specifically. Now they spoke to the Ramba Senior Technology Advisor Paul Kosher and he had quite a bit to say. Now obviously when Intel first tried to mitigate the issues that Spectre and Meltdown had, they did microcode tweaks. Now, obviously, as you guys most likely remember, they were not well received due to their impact on performance. And later on, of course, we had the 8th gen Whiskey Lake U series, which had hardware mitigation for these vulnerabilities, which obviously definitely helped. And there was other software and microcode fixes for Spectre variants alongside this for obviously other processors but Intel have been rather quiet about what exactly is going to be going on with Ice Lake as far as hardware fixes actually go. Now, obviously it's hard to know exactly what Intel has planned for Ice Lake in terms of hardware and software mitigations but according to Paul again the most important thing we're going to be seeing is an improvement of the earlier mitigations that Intel put in place so basically the earlier sort of software fixes that we did see from Intel are going to be either implemented in hardware or modified so the performance impact is going to be negligible, negligible excuse me. And Paul did say, quote, they've created these MSRs but right now the performance you get from leaving the protections enabled and using them in the operating system is so large that people aren't generally using them wildly. I suspect with the new processors they will fix that. They'll make them run with high enough performance so that it's safe to leave them enabled all the time. Now this is regarding Spectre Variant 2. Meltdown is pretty much going to be fixed alongside that. So the issue remains is Spectre Variant 1. And as at least as far as Paul has heard, the only plans that he is at least aware of, Intel has no concrete plan in place for Spectre Variant 1 and the current proposal would have a significant performance impact. And he said, quote, from what I know of Intel's roadmap for the next few years is not a clear solution that's been put forward. It's an unmitigated risk that will be lingering for a long time. And he also further believes that he is not really seeing much changing in the future of CPU chip design that is actually going to address the core of the issues because obviously all of these security vulnerabilities, Spectre, Variants 1 and 2 and of course Meltdown is you know, speculative attacks and unfortunately many manufacturers use speculative optimizations to enhance performance which obviously still leaves them vulnerable. So unfortunately it's not something we're going to be rid of anytime soon. Now obviously Spectre... 2 and 3, or Meltdown and Spectre Variant 2 if you want to be exact, they're most likely going to be taken care of. It's Spectre Variant 1 that is still going to be looming over things, unfortunately. Let's finish things up, shall we, with a bit of gaming news with EA. As today, their stocks have taken a significant dive of just under 13%, or 12.83% uh, to be exact, compared to their opening hours, and this is a dip towards a 80 dollar 61 valuation per share compared to the 92 dollars 52 that we had at the opening market now this is basically in direct result of their q3 financial year 19 results which showed lower than expected sales from battlefield 5 and also lower revenue from their mobile games as well now this does make me scratch my head a little bit because battlefield 5 is not exactly done badly by any stretch of the imagination it's just fell short of their expectations which might raise the question of are their expectations actually reasonable because Battlefield 5 sold 7.3 excuse me million units but still fell close to a million short projected sales by this time. 
So perhaps their expectations were a little unrealistic. I've, I've said this before when um, Square Enix were disappointed with how Tomb Raider did, the, the first remaster, sorry, reboot that they did, and that came to insanely well, and yet it still wasn't enough, and, and that's because, frankly, their expectations were insane, and I do kind of wonder if we're going to have a similar situation here. As for their mobile business, however, we did see a fall of 22%, which obviously didn't go down well alongside the underperforming Battlefield 5. And this is despite the rather insane success that we have seen for Apex Legends, which I will actually be checking out most likely this weekend, so you can expect a video from me on that fairly soon, as that, that game has me intrigued, I at least want to give it a look-see and, and do something on it, so yeah. Regardless of that though, EA not having the best of the time, best of the time, best time, that's, that's the words that I was looking for, <laughs> not having the best time at the moment unfortunately, but again... I do wonder about the expectations of some of these AAA publishing houses. It's like, when a game is 7.3 million sales and is disappointing, you might want to readjust your expectations. I don't know. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. It does help out a great deal. And I'll see you next time.